Hello, everybody. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Max Convexti. I appreciate you guys being here. I have another CEO uh, here today. It's been the CEO summer uh, today. I have all the fans, CEO and founder. Uh, Cy, tell us a little bit about you and tell us about your company, please. Yeah, great, Max. Thanks so much for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be on, uh, especially I was actually checking out some of your videos and I really enjoy how you sort of cut through a lot of the noise. And I think that's a common theme that we have here at Tap Alpha. So our whole goal is to provide powerful financial tools and access to uh, everyday investors and advisors. And so there's it's really easy to sort of get caught up in a lot of the noise that's out there. And so I really appreciate kind of the work that you do to cut through that. Um, and so I actually came from a totally different world, uh, computer engineering by trade, uh, ended up working for a startup in Silicon Valley um, that was ultimately acquired by Cisco. And then back in the early 2000s, I actually founded my first technology company. But the through line through all of it has been, how do you take innovation and technology and apply it to industries where there's huge upside to make a big impact? And so that world was taking innovation and applying it to construction uh, using mobile technology. Everything was done on pen and paper before, and then we came with mobile devices and technology to help make that more efficient. Um, and I ran that company for a long time, 17 years, but had always been really passionate about finance. And I thought, you know, I blinked my eyes and all of a sudden most of my career was behind me. And I thought, if I'm going to make a change, I got to do it now. And then the other factor, and this was October of 2022, but the other big factor was my wife and I were pregnant at the time and we we're going to have our first baby girl four months from that timing. And so, you know, that, that gives perspective. And I thought, all right, I'm going to make a change and I'm going to do it now. But then there's the practical day-to-day -day challenges of, okay, you want to start a company in finance, you're figuring out what that idea is going to be, but how are you going to make ends meet? And so at that time, um, you know, I don't know if you remember, but in October 22, the markets were way down. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to have to sell. I'd always been a long-term buy and hold investor, just bought the SPY and it treated me really well over the years because I was busy running the company. Sure. But um, at that time, I remembered a strategy that my dad had taught me uh, using covered calls. And it was kind of a perfect storm because right in October of 22 was the first time that daily covered calls were now available on a certain set of indices. And one of those indices happened to be the S&P 500. So I tried actually manually doing this for a couple of months and lo and behold, uh, it blew my mind because it covered the lion's share of our mortgage. And for us at that time, it was such a huge financial relief that we got to keep our shares. It helped fill some of the void from the income perspective and took a lot of the pressure off the family. And so I was able to be present for my daughter's first year free of financial stress. And that was a huge sort of aha moment in figuring out, wait a minute, if this benefits us, how do I help other families like ours? And so with the software background, I ended up, it, it was a lot of work, right? So if I was working, I couldn't actually probably execute the strategy. Um, took three to four hours a day. But with the software background, I ended up writing uh, cloud-based technology to help me do this. You know, it executes the trades every day, helps me do all the analysis in real time. And it took four hours a day down to under four or five minutes. And wow. that was a huge impact. And just trying to figure out, hey, how do we bring this value to market? And so we had a few choices. Do we launch a fintech company where you can connect your brokerage account and then have it help you automate the strategy on any underlying equity? But then I ended up meeting some folks in the industry and they're like, you know, think about ETFs as a way to help make these strategies accessible to everybody. And so I did research on that and found out that an ETF actually is kind of a magic tool for us to take this strategy um, and wrap it in the convenience and, you know, ultimately efficiency of an ETF and deliver it to everybody in the market. And that absolutely hits our mission of wanting to provide access to financial opportunity. And so that's how the company got started. Uh, and actually the same month my daughter was born, we founded Tap Alpha. And then in another sort of uh, magic moment, we just launched T-SPY, which is our very first publicly traded ETF where it does this on the S&P 500. And we actually launched that ETF on my dad's birthday on August 15th. So everything is sort of aligning, stars are aligning, coming together to sort of get this first fund out into the world. 
That's awesome. Um, yeah, I learned about covered calls for my dad as well a long time ago, back when I was in high school in the 80s, and about and about short puts and about cash secure puts. But yeah, they've been around forever and people have been using them forever to, uh, my dad's a financial planner. He used them for tax planning and financial planning, but, but you can also use them for tactical, you know, you can use them for anything, but it also makes a great use case. Like for you, when you guys were wanting to, were wanting to convert some of your, or not to have to convert some of your assets into cash. You know, it's there's a great use case for that. Uh, with my dad, it was always to try to avoid to pay capital gains. Lots uh -huh. of times you have a, you know, you there's a person that maybe has, uh, I was a financial planner too, and you have somebody that comes to you that's worked for a company for years and they have stock, but they can't afford to sell it because their basis is like two bucks and it's uh -huh. like at 100 now. And they're like, I can't afford to sell it. You can always sell a few calls for them and then they can have some cash. Exactly. So I, I was a planner. And so then when I started seeing these, you know, right around the 2021, 2022, all of these, uh, you know, high yield daily covered call funds came out. And that's when I got interested because I know it works. It, it's worked for years. And now that they do it in the daily time frame, it's been kind of weaponized or, you know, anyway, I, I love the idea. I love the idea. And I, I read some of your literature I love uh, the idea of T-SPY. So let me ask you, when you were doing it for your, when you were doing it just to make ends meet, how were you doing it? Were you using the synthetic? Uh, were you doing it on the SPX? Were you doing it on a SPY? Were you using synthetics? Were you used, did you buy shares in the SPY and write options? How, how did you do it? And how are you doing it in T-SPY? Yeah, when I was doing it for myself, um, it was the most vanilla version. So I own the SPY underlying, which I had owned for a long time. And then I just wrote SPY equity calls on top. Um, and that was easy for me to execute. And because of the amount of capital that I had, um, it wasn't a, you know, it fit well because once you go to SPX, that's 10 times the notional and you sort of have less flexibility there because it's a much bigger dollar value. Absolutely. Um, and, and so there's some drawbacks to doing it actually in your individual accounts that way. Two things um, that were sort of a, a drawback to doing it the vanilla way. Number one, call away risk is real. Uh, and yeah. so when things go against you, you know, we manage the strategy to be about 80, 20, 80% 80 of the time, those calls are going to expire worthless. And 20% of the time you got to take an action where it'll go in the money and you got to figure out what you want to do. And that 20% of the time happens a couple times a month. And so if you get called away, that has tax implications, uh, cost implications. And so that's one of the challenges. Um, the other challenge too, the income that comes in with SPY equity um, options is taxed at ordinary income. So one of the things that we actually pushed for when we were working to implement the strategy in the fund, um, and it, it was extra work to do so, we wanted to hold the underlying equities. It's just one of those things as an investor, if you want to own something real, the actual equities, like that's important to you. But what we learned is there's actually potential tax benefits, potential. And again, we're not accountants, so you got to do your own research in owning the equities in an ETF. And I'll get into that in a minute. But we ended up implementing the strategy with SPX uh, as the core option tool and owning the actual SPY, the, the real equity um, underneath it. And we're executing that every day. And we're doing it in a dynamic way because we're actually using the FinTech platform to help us decide were to take that position and we, we execute it every day. And so that's another big differentiator is it's dynamic because you don't necessarily want a static interval for your position if you're trying to keep it within your risk profile because imagine writing the same call interval the day that Jay Powell speaks versus a day that there's no news, right? So sure. having the dynamic features, I think a really strong <clears throat> differentiator for what we're trying to do here at Peace Buy. So, well, I got a couple of questions. Uh, yeah. The first question is, well, I, if you just, the way I handle that situation that you just talked about is to sell a specific Delta every day that mm -hmm. in on the daily, you know, there's daily volatility and it will adjust. And if you sell it on the day he's speaking, it'll be, you know, I, so if you sell the, you know, the, you said 80, 20, if you sell the 20 Delta call every mm -hmm. day, you know what I'm saying? That's, you know, mm -hmm. some people sell the 30, but anyway, that's the way I handle that situation. But I love that. I'm not trying to shit on the dynamic. I love the dynamic. 
because you know that's the problem with covered calls is is you know you you cut off the upside at the times when you don't want to and then you get you get buffer, you know, on the downside when the times you don't need it. And then when you do need it, um, you know, the eternal question. So, yes, using fintech is awesome. I, I'm going to be I'd be anxious to see the results. So let me ask you, are you varying the distance out of the money you sell it and the amount of contracts you sell or just the distance out of the money? Just the distance out of the money. And to your point, I completely agree with you. Delta is one very important input but it's not the only input. And so that's where the FinTech comes in because it can pull in multiple uh, market dynamic elements and then help you figure out as a fund manager and then eventually as an individual investor when we end up getting the FinTech out there, it helps you understand the risk reward trade-off based on not just Delta, but other inputs like volume, like planned market events, uh, volatility, of course. And so all of those things actually play in and the system processes that in real time to help you make a, a tighter decision based on where your risk profile sits. And so you're absolutely right. Delta is very important, but it's one of many inputs. Absolutely. So in, yeah, uh, no, and I, I love the idea of it. So, but you're going to be, you're going to sell hundred percent notional at all times, I guess, but, but at sometimes you're going to sell super far out of the money, I would guess. And that means you're more bullish. And at sometimes you might even sell right at the money, I'm guessing, but you, I'll let you tell me, is that kind of how it's going to work? Yeah. And we're typically 25 Delta or less. So we're okay. targeting sort of low to moderate risk investors that are really, it's similar to the situation where I was using it. We're buying hold. We want to hold it for a long time. We want to uh, capture, you know, as much of the underlying capital growth as we can and then supplement with this income engine on top. And so that's kind of the goal there where, you know, we're, we're trying to add, uh, we're really focusing on, I, re I watched one of your prior videos um, and I was really happy to see it. You talk about people optimizing on yield versus total returns. And we're a total return fund. That's what we're really trying to focus on. Yes. And, and I could tell that by your literature and I watched some of your interviews um, no, and I was really interested. Um, so you actually, yeah, I, I looked at your holdings there today and I saw that you had 4,000 shares of SPY, 4,300 shares of SPY or something, and you had four big contracts, so four SPXs, and then mm -hmm. you had three little contracts, XSPs, mm -hmm. the smaller ones. So yeah, it was a full overwrite. So in you, you're aiming, you're generally, it's about the 25 Delta is what, what you're aiming for, but your FinTech platform might have you sometimes shoot for the 20 or something. I mean, if you're more bullish, you're, you would shoot for a lower Delta because it gives you more room for upside. Yep. That's exactly okay. right. So we do 25 Delta or less. So 25 is kind of more of our upper end um, okay. or less. And so that gives us the headroom that we want, gives us that 80, 20 ratio, and then gives us supplemental potential income on top of the capital growth of the underlying share. So do you sell the options in the morning or at night? Are they the zero DTs? They're true zero DT. And that's actually, I'm glad you raised that. It's a really important point. So we are true zero DTE. There are some other funds out there that claim it, but they're still actually taking on overnight risk. And for us, it's really important from the strategy perspective that we write it in the morning for the same day that it sort of expires. And sometimes we'll roll it if we, if we need to, but most of the time it's, it's same day zero DTE. And the main reason for that is um, overnight risk. You know, when do earnings happen? Those happen after market close. When do, does economic data? Most of the time it happens before market open. And so instead of being in a position and then having it potentially go against you, we wait until market opens, the market reacts, and then we can take our spot. And then that helps us stay tighter to the underlying equity growth but then we still have an opportunity to get additional income on top. And so it really helps limit the overnight risk um, that one DTE or, you know, weekly or monthly has to sort of, uh, has to sort of take on. Well, the, you know, what the counter argument is you, you all, you, you also aren't, when, when you take overnight risk, you also get overnight, uh, you also earn overnight yield. So it, it's mm -hmm. about, if you look at like, there's established funds that take overnight risk on one day, and they pay about double the yield that the that the newer funds take that don't take the overnight risk. I'm sure you're aware of this, but just in case the people that are watching aren't, then uh, the other advantage, the real advantage is in a bull market, 
these funds that aren't taking any, any positions overnight, oftentimes overnight in a bull market, you'll have uh, markets that are up a percent. And so the, so the fund that takes the position the next morning, of course, like you guys are in a lot better position. I know what you're saying, stick closer to the equity and stuff. No, I get it. But also uh, it, it puts you in a lot better position. However, in, in a bear market, in a bear market, it's going to put you in the opposite position. But anyway, we barely ever have bear markets, so we don't even need to worry about it. No, I love I love the strategy. So you're so take it on in the morning and sometimes sell the 25 delta if you're kind of bearish. But if you're bullish, sell up something less than that. Mm -hmm. OK, so what are you so what kind of yield are you targeting? We're targeting probably between six to seven and a half percent yield. Um, but again, okay. if we. You know, the goal is if we can capture the majority of the underlying capital gains, capital growth, and then also provide a six to seven and a half percent yield, yeah. that will be a monster, monster set of performance stats for us. So that's kind of our target. That's what we're shooting for. Um, whether it happens, no one can predict the future, but I think we've got the tool set, the capabilities to sort of uh, shoot for that and fingers crossed, we'll see what happens. But we're taking that more conservative approach because that's our end outcome and our goal. Well, now I know exactly what you mean. So I think the use case for funds like yours are um, maybe uh, it's the same use case you're in, but maybe a couple, uh, maybe a couple, maybe they both work and they both have careers, but then maybe the wife wants to stay home with the kids, uh, but they both have a little bit of stock. But yes, they could use they could use part of their retirement in some of these funds to make that happen. You know, you're talking six, seven percent. You know, it may not sound like a lot to people. There's other real stable funds that pay eight or nine percent, but you're you're making that much. It's about a twenty to thirty percent premium on on just T bills and on, on bond funds, which is all people have for years. You didn't have the ability unless you had your own financial planner that would sell options for you. You didn't have the ability to make this type of return. Nowadays, it's so easy also to do it. So I, I think you're in the right space at the right time. I'm, and I'm, that's why I'm really excited to be uh, talking to you. Now, do you have funds for a, uh, a Q version of this? Or, I mean, do you have plans? Yeah, uh, we actually have already uh, on the same prospectus for T-SPY. We also got SEC uh, effective for T-DAC, which is essentially the same strategy on the Qs. And then downstream, uh, there's potential for T-Russ, which will be the same strategy on the Russell. And then we'll continue to grow from there. But we wanted to prove the concept, prove the technology, and then the underlying fintech platform will help run all of those funds. And so from an efficiency standpoint, it really helps us scale the business model once we you know, kind of get to the sweet spot of what the, what the market is asking for. Are you going to make the fintech platform uh, to, uh, uh, available to advisors or, or is it just privately for you guys to is do you have any plans for that separate of, of the fund long term yes um so we'll have the fintech platform which will help build the brand will show the returns with the tap alpha etf suite and then advisors can actually sit so to your point people that have low basis uh equities can then use a platform the advisor can use it to then manage this covered call program on any equity underlying so we have a lot of i'm here in seattle got a lot of Amazon executives, Microsoft executives, um, and those folks have really low basis to their companies. And in some cases, like if the market's stagnant, this really helps them supplement their income uh, to get more out of what they have. And that's that's also the whole concept, uh, tapping the potential of what you already have in order to maximize its effect and output. It, it's so it's such a uh, crucial, crucial thing. I'm, I'm so glad that uh, it's just a great time to be an investor. But uh, and, and funds like this, and there's other ones too, are, are just a, an example why. I mean, you just, this was just not available before. You, you would have had to know an, a, some guy like you or your dad, and they would have had to explain to you how covered calls work. You would have had to get the Wall Street Journal out and look at it, mm -hmm. call your broker. You could do all this, but there was a huge barrier to entry. You needed money, more money, you know, and commissions were $50 or $100. The spreads were a half point. In fractions, mm -hmm. I don't know uh, how old you are. When I was an advisor in the '90s, the, uh, you know, a, a, an option might trade at three and a half, bid at three and a half, asked at three and three quarters. Mm -hmm. So you paid a fifty-dollar commission on every trade, and then there was a twenty-five or fifty-dollar 
$32, $38, whatever, some kind of hidden commission on every trade. It was almost impossible to make money. Nowadays, you, you know, with commissions basically free, I know there's still trading costs hidden in there and stuff, but with trading costs being as low as they are, it makes all kinds of strategies that were never profitable before, never, especially to a retail trader. And now there are people like you that are making them available. You know, you, you hit it on the head because one of the challenges when you think about doing a, it's a more frequent, more active trading strategy when you're doing this every day. Yes. And the commissions and the trading costs actually can make uh, a measurable impact. And so one of the ways we solve for it, uh, and it's so powerful, was the SPX options themselves. Because they're 10 times the notional, you have to buy one tenth the number of contracts. So we're virtually from what I did when I was doing it myself to doing it in the fund, we're saving 80 plus percent on commissions directly. And that's a huge win when you're doing transactions every day in the market. Of course, you're trading like an institution. You know, Warren Buffett and banks and stuff don't use the SPY. They use SPX. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and of course, so you can use pick up economies of scale when you have ETFs. I know you know all this, but no, that's uh, that's uh, super exciting. Well, I wish there uh, I wish there'd be a smart guy like you, some other fund manager out there that would bring in. I've, I'm I want people to somebody to bring an act a long volatility an active long volatility fund out there. Hmm. where it's a fund that owns a straddle. I'm sure you know about this kind of stuff. Owns a straddle, but at the same time, there maybe owns a straddle in the monthly time frame, but they maintain it by selling uh, by selling strangles in the daily time frame or something, to, hmm. you know, to earn income to offset it. Anyway, I would love an active long vol fund, but there but there just isn't one. It's a niche. I don't really want you to bring one out. You need to, you need to worry about bringing out the popular ones first, but uh, that's I great. Whenever I talk to CEOs, I'm trying to get somebody to bring out that kind of fund. I love it. it was, and you, I mean, it's really interesting too when you do the comparison for higher frequency options. So daily options versus monthly. And this is one of the things that we're gathering data on. If you look at some of the popular funds, right? Jeppy, you know, 34 billion under management, 30 day fund, and then some of the dailies. What's interesting if you took the same level of risk, so 25 delta and you wrote a 30 day call versus if you did the same risk level every day, 25 Delta every day over that period, but you just did it daily, the premiums that are available are between three and four times the level of premiums versus if you wrote one call for 30 days. And as an investor, and I was deciding, you know, what, what's the right increment and interval. And the two things about daily that are really powerful. Number one, you're able to take advantage of the steepest part of the slope. Yeah. time decay and number two the premiums you get you actually get rewarded for it so if i'm an investor saying i'm taking the same risk why am i going to cross this bridge when i'm only going to get a third of the reward versus i'll cross this bridge for the same level of risk and actually get triple and so for us when we were trying to de design this fund dailies were, were the best way to go and the people on my station you may have noticed this by watching the station we're more into the mechanics of the options. I don't think there's any bad funds out there. I think that I'm afraid that people are misusing them. People mm -hmm. see, and you know this, people see the 50% yield mm -hmm. and they aren't buying it as part of an allocation in a retirement portfolio like me. They're buying it as an, as a, hell, let's put a, put a hundred thousand in it. I was going to buy a lake house, but I'll, I'll throw this money in it for a year and see how I do. One of those type things. Mm -hmm. and, and I just, that's totally the wrong way to do it. And then, and then inevitably bad things happen. And then of course, those things make it to the internet. And these funds have a terrible name, which wasn't where I was going with that question. But let's talk about that. I'm sure you're on Reddit and you've, you've seen some of the bad name. Now, I assume you're going to alleviate some of that with your fund because you're focused on return and not shield. But still, a lot of these covered call funds have a bad name for return of capital and other stuff. Do you have any comments on that? I think the main thing is just setting expectations properly. You, you, you sort of said it best where um, in some cases they're misused. And a lot of that has to do with expectation setting. So one of the first things you see as sort of a new investor coming in to understand these products is you see yield front and center. And it's just it's put right right up up in your face and you see it and you're like this is a huge number but one thing that they don't it's not really obvious to the everyday investor is that a high yield doesn't mean a high return 
those are, you know, there is a connection, but ultimately they're very different things. And so helping educate investors on what are the metrics that are important so that they can map it to their own situation is also another part of our mission. It's, it's innovation and education. And so helping people understand, yeah, we're optimized on total returns because at the end of the day, you know, you don't want to get a high yield, but then watch the capital part, the NAV go down over time. So our goal is to try and maintain the NAV, minimize uh, any NAV decay, help provide that income component. And because you're doing it daily, you can track much closer to what the underlying index is doing. That's the goal of the fund. Total returns is the metric that we're really going to be focused on. And, and hopefully we can help educate investors on what, why that's important. Here's the trade off. Here's what I was talking about when I was looking at the um, looking at uh, the funds over time. So the more frequent funds are more efficient at gathering or the more frequent writing strategies are more efficient at gathering yield. Absolutely. But they're also more efficient at capping upside. When you do the I agree with you, I like the daily strategy. I'm just playing devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. Yes, you get you have an opportunity to get more money. And I say even sell at 24 hours and take the overnight money too, but whatever, it, it doesn't matter. I agree with you on the daily, do it as often as possible, but, but, the, but it's a daily cap. All I'm saying is you're more, it's, it's awesome that you get more income, but as you know, the price for more income is you cap yourself more aggressively. Mm -hmm. Let's just say that. Now I like your trade off though, by, cause you don't really do it at night. So you're uncapped at night, you're capped during the day. So you, it's a great, it's a great trade-off because really I think maybe you solved the problem, you know, because that that that's the like I say, the the, the shorter time frames are great for yield, but they, they suck for capping more aggressively. But maybe, maybe that's the problem. Maybe it's, but do you have any comments on that? I think the it's it's something that I think performance will tell. And the thing I I see about I'm I'm known for terrible analogies. So we can cut this if we need to, but my terrible analogy of the day is, you know, when they're playing soccer and it's a free kick and you got a goalie, but the goalie has to make a decision before the person who gets the free kick actually kicks the ball because of the rate of change. Yes. Well, what's great about dailies is you have enough uh, tightness to what the market's doing that if there's an event, you don't necessarily have to make your bet before. So on days that Jay Powell, speaks that's when the kicker kicks afterwards you can actually set your position and in some cases because the volatility is still baked into the premiums you still get the benefit of the premiums even after the event occurs and so from that perspective it helps it's really just about risk mitigation because you don't have to guess as much because you're much closer to when the market's actually taking action like i say i agree with you i was just trying to uh trying to play devil's advocate. The other, thing, the other thing about it, you know, I'm always asking for a long, vol long volatility fund. But anyway, this when you, when you do this strategy, even though cover calls are short volatility, that's definitely a short volatility strategy, it belongs in that bucket of your portfolio. When you sell, the, when you do it a daily strategy, it gives a long volatility, a quasi long volatility element because it resets every day. And I heard you talking about that in the, you know, in, in your uh, video and stuff, but the daily reset is so important in all of these funds. I don't care if you sell it the night before the morning of all of these funds get the daily reset. And that is so important because the monthly funds that have all that money under management that do a great job and everything, they totally miss out on that. They mm -hmm. don't, they don't get, you know, like you say on the days Jay Powell speaks, it'll spike volatility and, and yeah, you, that's a great opportunity to go in and snag some of that and mm -hmm. then pay it out to your, uh, you know, to the people that, to your shareholders. I, I think it's a great idea. And I think you're, you know, I think you've, uh, you're on the right path. Um, I congratulate you on bringing this fund out. How much assets under management do you have right now? We just started. So we're uh, at the very beginnings. We're at about two and a half million right now and continuing to get assets in. I think the first month, um, month and a half was when we we're going to do our first distribution will be probably the first week of every month. So October. Um, and then once we sort of get that performance behind us, get the distribution out and actually prove the model, then we're going to start marketing it a lot further. But I love having early conversations with people like you that understand the concepts underneath it um, and can share it with other folks that are, are interested in the early stage stuff. But yeah, we're just getting off the ground right now and it's been, been quite a ride so far.
Well, let's do this. Uh, maybe could I get you on when you again when you declared that maybe right after you declared the distribution or something? Or I mean, um, I think that'd be great. Uh, you know, I think my people would like to check in because I'll be about a month from now, right? To be around yep. the first week of October. Precisely. I would love to. I'd love to join again. So you've been open two weeks. So you're going to do about, you're going to get about six weeks. So it'll probably be kind of a big distribution too, right? It'll be a month and a half's worth. Yeah, a month and a half's worth. Um, I'm trying to decide exactly what the number is going to be. It's good to have a little bit of a buffer. Of course, we have to distribute over time, but I want to also set the expectation of what a typical distribution will be. So we'll decide between now and then based on performance, what the number will be. But, you know, you've, you've seen what we're, what we're shooting for and fingers crossed everything goes, goes to plan this month. Well, uh, Sai, it's been great talking to you. It looks like our 30 minutes is about up. I'm sure you have other people to talk to. I know running a fund and starting a fund is, uh, I'm sure you're busy and and all that, but I appreciate you taking time out of your day to talk with us here at, uh, at uh, the Daily Cover Caller. Thank you so much for being on and we'll have great you back. Great to be with you, Max. Thanks so much.